You can go ahead, Seth. All right. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And I uh, really want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, taking the time to make the call today. Um, as most of y'all know, kind of the context for this or the setting was um, this is a public housing authority um, and and I guess the housing crisis uh, to us, we believe go like kind of uh, as a solution to the housing crisis, we believe go hand in hand. Um, so we had submitted this uh, petition um, and had been doing a lot of research, um, kind of looking at the history of uh, affordable housing and the way it's been talked about and the way that policy has been set uh, in Gallatin County and more specifically in Bozeman. Um, that culminated into us submitting this petition in August. Uh, and then uh, there's new people on this call that I have uh, not met before, um, but pretty much anybody, um, we've, we've been talking about this concept with um, several, several of you. So it's not unfamiliar for me to mention Montgomery County um, and Zach Marks and the work that they've been doing um, with their uh, housing production fund. Um, so with that being said, um, I will, yeah, today it's like one of those, I don't think I need to convince anybody on this call that the housing crisis um, in Bozeman and um, and nationally as well, but specifically for Bozeman has been highlighted in multiple um, national publications. Uh, so we think that this is a real opportunity and so excited, so daggum stoked to be um, watching Zach or be in the same Zoom room as Zach um, instead of just like watching YouTube and also Ken as well. So I'm excited. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Natsuki. Okay, yes, just for, um, we'll be hearing from Zachary Marks today and also later um, we'll be hearing from Bob Strachan from the AFL-CIO. So I'll introduce Bob when he hops on later, but for um, Zach, we have um, the Chief Real Estate Officer of the Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, Mr. Marks joined the HOC in 2013 in his role. In this role, he is responsible for HOC's property-related activities, including real estate acquisitions and development, property maintenance, property management, and asset management. Mr. Marks has, helped, um, has had more than 15 years of experience in real estate, previously working in the private sector and nonprofit firms and covering more than a dozen major markets throughout the United States. During his tenure of HOC, Mr. Marks has led the entitlement and design and financing of more than $860 million of transactions, including renovation projects for over 1,800 units, new construction projects um, for over 700 units, acquisitions consummated for over 1,300 units, and light tech projects for 580 units. So with that, we'll hand it over to Zach to hear about um, his nationally acclaimed model that he's helping with over in Maryland. Uh, you are very kind. I usually like the bar to be lowered before we get started, but uh, but thank you. Those are really, really nice of you to say those things. Um, if I could get uh, screen sharing capability, I will quickly run through a presentation um, that Ken very nicely built that um, and he and I can kind of bounce through it, but it, it'll give you a little bit of context for who we are, but um, but really the punchline at the end is that this is a model that's, uh, that is highly applicable and uh, very flexible and can be employed in, in, in very, very different markets. So it's, so I don't want you to like, as you, as we just sort of give you a little bit of background on HSC to think that, oh, well, we don't have that and we're not like that. So this doesn't work. It's, this really is a, um, a core idea that can be deployed anywhere. And it's particularly useful in markets where uh, the appreciation of real estate is um, is significant. And obviously, Bozeman and a lot of other places in Montana, that's certainly certainly an issue. So, um, so I will quickly share up here. And then are you all able to see this? If I go to presentation mode, just let me know if something goes wrong. Or if it happens at all. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Um, so um, Montgomery County is huge. It's got a million people. 
it's 500 square miles. Um, we have pretty high, pretty high rents, pretty high cost of construction, high cost of living, uh, and so on and so forth. So we're right on the northern edge of the district. Uh, it's a county that is as big as it is basically because of the advent of uh, the federal government uh, in the 60s and 70s. And the county has really, um, you know, been a, it's a, a home to many of the people that work in that space or in the adjacent space, you know, defense contractors on and on. So it's just, that's a county that has just always been kind of almost recession proof because the government's right next door and, and Montgomery County is, you know, where a lot of these folks raise their families and retire and educate their children and so on and so forth. Um, Ken, I don't know if you want to tick through this real quick. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I think one of the things that's a little bit uh, unique about HOC is that um, in the 70s, our county and state leaders, uh, you know, kind of came together and decided to try to build out an agency that could be kind of a complete uh, affordable housing agency rather than just a, so we started as just a traditional PHA administering public housing. Um, so we, we continue to do that function uh, through the uh, HUD's rental assistance demonstration program. We no longer have any traditional public housing units. We've converted all of those um, in, uh, into other types of affordable housing, um, but we do administer uh, vouchers uh, for the county um, we are also a housing finance agency, so that means we can issue our own bonds and finance our own projects. Um, and we are an FHA risk share uh, agency, which just gives us a sort of additional layer of uh, ability to, to uh, finance our own projects. Um, and then, uh, you know, we call ourselves a, a public developer, so we kind of have all the authorities of a nonprofit uh, affordable housing developer to be able to use tax credits. Um, and any other kind of uh, mechanism to develop um, primarily mixed income uh, housing. And really the key, uh, as it relates to the housing production fund and our business model, you know, this mixed income business model, the real key here is really this, is this ownership piece um, that is really the key to uh, beginning to think about how to apply it to, you know, to things in, in, in Bozeman. Um, the housing finance agency el agency element will also be important as well, but we'll circle back around on that. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that um, even though the housing production fund is what has really gotten us a lot of attention, often there is the assumption that HOC started doing sort of this, this uh, mixed income model at the same time. But the reality is HOC has been doing the mixed income for a long time, and really the housing production fund was the answer to a question from a council member that Ken happened to work for at the time uh, as to how can we help you guys do more of these mixed income deals that you've been doing for a long time uh, and do them faster. So beginning in the early 80s, um, you know, the commission did a debt only financing uh, new construction deal where it just decided it was going to make um, a portion of the building affordable at different affordability levels, but the balance was going to be market rate. There's no tax credits involved here. Uh, it's just, it was just literally um, HOC and uh, land that it was able to develop. Uh, then, um, as the LIHTC program matured after the creation, its creation in 1986, for a bunch of reasons, I'm happy to get into, but we don't have to. It's not super relevant to the HPF. But HOC's next sort of evolution was was um, using this sort of condominium approach to low income housing tax credits, which means simply. We were still doing mixed income where we had a majority of our units market rate, but our affordable units were being put into legal com condominiums, same building scattered throughout, but in, in a legal, legal ownership, there were two legal ownerships within the building. The market rate units were owned 100% by HOC and the LIHTC was 100% controlled, but obviously owned by the low income housing tax credit investor. And so you can see kind of the, the typical share there on Alexander House, a 305 unit building with 122 uh, as LIHTC. And so that you can see kind of a, that's a, it's kind of a 60-40 there. But HOC has over the many generations um, been a big proponent. You know, we do 100% tax credit deals. We, we do RAD. We, we have most of the, we are the owner of most of the subsidized housing in the county. We do all that other stuff. But HOC has long made a determination that in addition to that, it wants to be a big mixed income developer 
And for us, mixed income means that we will own market rate units in addition to the creation of affordable housing. Um, and then really the, the kind of seminal moment for the HPF came with Bolinley, where before the HPF was created, we did we produced a 200 unit multifamily building in an incredibly influent part, affluent part of the county. And we did it with basically our own cash. We did it uh, in, in a venture with a foundation out of the district uh, who also brought some cash. And then we are the lender, the, we are the FFB FHA or share lender on the deal. And we, um, and this is a building that is 80% or sorry, 60% market, 20% workforce, 20% at 50% AMI. And, um, and this building did insanely well. And the good news is we, we got about 51% of that insanely well. The part that was hard for us is that we did not get 40, that 49% of that belonged to the other investor, this foundation out of DC. And so when we got together with Ken, who at the time was working for a very innovative creative council member on, on the county council, uh, and he asked us, what kind of a tool do we need? We'd love a tool where we never have to have that feeling again, where instead HOC is 100% or, you know, a much higher percentage owner of these deals so that when they, we build them and they lease up and then they appreciate um, significantly that, that, that as much as possible, that value stays with us, the government. Um, so that tool is the, that we came up with ultimately was the housing production fund. It is a very, very simple piece of financing. So the hard part about explaining this to people in the affordable housing space is normally we're used to calculus and, um, you know, needing, you know, an insane level of brain image to get to understand what the program is. That's, you know, affordable housing finance is supposed to be painful and complicated. And the hard part about explaining this is it's actually really, really, really simple. It is simply municipal finance put into a fund that HOC then uses to create ownership in its projects and it's and it's used during the construction phase, construction lease phase of that project. And so the first 50 million was approved by the council in the spring of 21. It was so successful that they told us to come back because they were going to give us 50 million more. We weren't even really asking for it yet, but you don't say no. So we took that. And, um, and the way it works is the county uh, is providing the principal and interest for a, for a 20 year bond that is paid at a fixed rate at the time of the issuance of the bonds uh, to support these two $50 million chunks. Uh, now you may see in the bullet point here that HOC actually issued the bonds. It's not really that important. Like the county could have just done it by itself. We just happened, we, we did it this sort of uh, extra, a little extra complicated way for various reasons that aren't super duper important. They were just little maximization type decisions. And so what this fund then does is we take that 50 million, put it into the fund. The fund then is controlled fully by HOC. We turn around, we loan it into our transactions where normally there would either be low income housing tax credits or there would be private equity. And we simply loan it in at a simple 5% interest. And that interest gets paid back to the fund. So the fund is making uh, for the for each 50 million, the fund is making about 2.5 million in interest back from these deals per year. Just to give you a sense of where of how powerful this is, uh, in the in the private development world, when they go use private equity, that private equity is typically uh, something like 15 to 20 percent is the cost of that capital. And so instead, uh, this is priced at five. So one of, that's one of the ways in which this is really powerful. The other way, of course, is that along with that 15 to 20 percent return, you're also giving the private equity and interest, almost all the returns that come out of that period of investment. So if the deal does really well, almost all of that redounds to the benefit of the private equity investor. Instead, with the housing production fund, that comes to uh, the government entity HSC. After five years, the project is built and stabilized. Uh, we picked five years because our projects typically take two to three years to build and about one to two years to stabilize. So highly scientific. Five years to then get to stabilization and pay that money back out. We can get into how that works. But one of the key pieces is back on this slide, which is 
the housing finance agency. So we happen to be it. It's okay if the entities are separate, but this is a this is a really key rule is the high the housing finance agency is should be sitting there ready to provide the permanent financing to the stabilized property. It's actually a good business line for the housing finance agency because it's another fee stream they can get beyond from their tax credit activities. Um, but that permanent finance is what makes this such a powerful model. We put the permanent financing in, in place at closing of construction so that whether we're using a private bank loan or whether we're also the construction lender, you know, the we, we already know what the permanent financing is going to look like in year five to be able to pay back the HPS. So all the way along, we really wanted to make sure that people felt like, you know, they had a belt on and suspenders at the same time around, is this thing really going to evolve, revolve every five years? Because it's very important that it does uh, in order to get the kinds of numbers that you see here uh, in terms of 6,000 new units over the next, you know, over 20, over 20 years from 100 million. Uh, and then really quickly, the other than having a controlling stake, uh, there's also a minimum affordability of 20% of the units at 50 and 10 at about 70% AMI. Uh, but that is definitely a jumping off point for our commission. They always push me to put more in no matter, you know, how difficult that is. So um, another, another piece of this that was really important was that uh, it needs to be fast if we're going to meet this housing crisis. It means we can't put in place a new uh, tool that takes forever to use. So this is something that because it's municipal finance, and actually it was really not, and Ken can correct me here, but it really wasn't legislation as much as it was just a budget line item. And so uh, it, it wasn't like a piece of philosophical legislation that needed to be argued about. It was literally just creating that line item to pay the principal and interest annually for 20 years on that bond to fund the fund. And other than creating some governing documents, you can see that we, the council passed the, HF, uh, the HPF in March of 21. And we already issued the bonds five months later and made the first loan um, December of that, that year. And in fact, the laureate as referenced there is, um, is actually, um, it opened in April of this year and at least up in seven months. So it's already stabilized and could potentially revolve in about two and a half years as opposed to, uh, to five. So way ahead of schedule uh, and we can get into some of the reasons why that happened. Um, one of the other key elements of the HPF in this market right now, you may be hearing stories from uh, the private development community, certainly we are, that things are very, very hard to finance right now on the private side. Um, and so that, it, you know, that creates uh, conservative investment in the development pipeline. Uh, developers are less likely to, in, to, to invest if they know that, you know, if they get their timing wrong, they're going to be trying to close on financing in the wrong market. And then all that money they put into the deal is trapped and they, they're not getting paid development fee and all of that goes wrong. Well, HOC as a developer is also you know, the commission is thinking about those same things when it commits to doing what are very large projects that take a long time to get entitled and permitted. And so having the HPF there where we actually know we have 100% of the financing we need for these projects ahead of time um, allows the commission to more, um, you know, to, to be a little bit more um, aggressive about investing in projects, adding new projects to the pipeline, because it now knows that it, it isn't as exposed to conditions precisely like, like the one we're in right now. And so one of the things I just wanna highlight quickly, it'll be a punchline later, but these are really, really big projects. In fact, the HPF is better in, in our market is better applied to larger projects for the reasons of just sort of units per, you know, per person in terms of 24 hour days. So we just try, we try, what we try to do is do really large transit oriented uh, developments that are putting as many units on the ground as possible, as fast as possible. That's our approach. It does not need to be your approach. And if you've talked to, since you have talked to some of these other folks that have, you know, that have spoken to us, one of the things I'm sure you noticed is that they are not doing it the same way that we are, that they have already, you know, they've already surpassed us in many ways in terms of the innovations that they've made and really adapting these ideas to their market 
the issues that they're confronted with, the kind of development that's appropriate to their community and so on and so forth. But just from our perspective, our view is we're, we're trying to push out, you know, kind of 250 to 450 unit projects uh, as fast as possible. That's important because one of the criticisms that sometimes floats around out there is that, oh, well, tax credit deals are 100% affordable and you are only doing 30. So it's not as, you know, it's not as mission oriented. And the reality is that uh, percentages aren't really the right way to look at this uh, from our perspective. So one thing that you may notice if you look at the tax credit new construction deals done in your community, what we did was we looked at um, all the tax credit new construction uh, uh, developments that were delivered in Montgomery County over the last seven years. And one of the things that is typical is that because, uh, because of the way that the state of HFAs can construct these programs, they basically, there's a solve for that is pretty much the same size project every single time. In Montgomery County, the average size of a 4% LIHTC development is 132 units. And you get about a some, somewhere between 80 to hundred percent of those are going to be affordable. And so that's true. It is, you know, you're getting a bigger percentage of those units is affordable, much bigger. But what's different is that when you apply our 30%, to what are 250 to 450 um, unit projects, what you get at 30% um, is very close to, if not entirely, an extra tax credit deal with the benefit of not having used those finite resources that tax credit deals need to get done. Soft funding, volume cap, tax credits themselves. So what you're effectively getting from the housing production fund is an extra tax credit deal without using um, the resources. This was very important to the concept because in order for the housing production fund to be about production, it had to not cannibalize other existing channels for production. So the private sector uh, needs to do its part. Nonprofit developers and who are doing light tech deals, they need to do their part. Nobody can stop well, this is a, what this was all about, was doing more and doing it in a way that didn't take away resources from any of those other groups. Ken, you want to ping this one? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the other ways that this is different than a lot of, you know, states or, or uh, municipalities that might have a housing trust fund uh, is, number one, those are often gap, just gap filling on uh, tax credit projects. Um, as, as we saw, so they're not, you know, they're, they're making those projects happen, but they're not necessarily able to stretch resources beyond what you're, it can get out of those allocations. Um, but there's other benefits to having public ownership of these, uh, projects. So number one is our ownership means that the affordability will never expire. It's not 20 years, 50 years, 99 years. Um, number two, you know, we're able to set our own policies for, uh, our the relationship with the, the residents of these buildings. So, uh, you know, we have an internal policy capping our rent increases at inflation, uh, and that applies to market units as well. Um, you know, we also build resident services. We have a, a pretty robust resident services program. We build that into the pro forma for these projects. So that's sort of something that's perpetually uh, covered, and, and we're uh, sure we're able to do that. Um, we can put in other uh, goals. So, you know, environmental performance, uh, you know, if you have an area that's a, a food desert and you want to make sure that there's a grocery store, you're able to, uh, you know, any number of uh, community goals, uh, you know, we're able to work co-located public facilities, like one of our buildings uh, has a rec center uh, that we, you know, we're able to build together with it, that, you know, a, a public uh, county rec center, uh, an aquatic center. Um, and then, uh, finally, you know, we capture the equity. Um, so as, as the mortgage gets paid down over time, um, you know, we're able to, uh, capture that value, reuse it, ensure that the, the buildings are reinvested, uh, and, and taken care of over time. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of takes us back to, you know, what Zach said earlier is that, you know, we have this floor for affordability, uh, that's sort of in our baked into our uh, the budget 
uh, language that the council adopted. Um, but we have a commission that's appointed by uh, our county executive um, that's approving these projects and is always pushing as hard as possible to increase that. Uh, sometimes we can do that uh, just because through the pro forma, we think we can do a little more and still make the numbers work. Sometimes we are able to do that by layering in uh, you know, project-based vouchers or other sources of subsidy. Um, you know, we can put permanent supportive housing units. We can make sure that some of these units are, you know, uh, uh, accessible and available for, for people with disabilities. Um, you know, you have that platform and, and you're able to imprint your own priorities on it um, in a way that even through, uh, you know, nonprofit developers in the community may not be able to, to do. Um, so, uh, so and I just... Yeah, I just I think that's a really important point that the the one of the really different conceptual ideas here around this is that it's a revolving fund that's only in the deal for five years and then it's gone. And then it's and it's and it's on to the next 750 deals or 750 units. So so this 50 million is going to continue to fund projects over and over and over again. Uh, once the 20 year bond is paid off. There's actually no further costs to the municipality, the county. After that point, the fund continues to revolve. So, so there's both a short-term important. There's an importance short-term, but there's also an importance long-term in that by creating this fund now, it's not a one-time. Okay, let's get this wave of deals done, and then we got to figure out how to raise more money for the next wave of deals, and then and we just do that in perpetuity, which is mainly what we do now via the LIDSEC program. Again, nothing wrong with that. We got to do that stuff too, because that's one of the main tools available to us. But, but in the in this case, this is a revolving fund that you can set up now, and at some point you won't need to set it up anymore. You won't need to continue to add to it. Like it will revolve and create enough housing and enough uh, ownership equity here that there is actually an you know an end to the rainbow here. So I just want to highlight that it's a little bit different to talk difficult to talk about because it. 20 to 30 years feels so far away, but um, but we're executing on stuff now that people, our predecessors 20 years ago did that created a ton of equity. Um, again, not from, this was not further funding from the county, the state, the feds, whatever. This is actually just equity that is created through owning market rate housing and not losing that value of the private sector. Um, so just really quickly in terms of like the kinds of activity, uh, it, these are major, major economic development uh, opportunities. This is just, uh, you know, this is, this is just sort of the, you know, the, the kind of economic output calculation that we have a, a, a piece of software that does this. It doesn't even get into things like, you know, completely, like we, we are often the first movers into parts of the county that have not seen recent investment. And we can spur parts of the county to suddenly be open, you know, to tell people, hey, this part of the county is now open for business and we're going to take the first step. So you don't have to <laughs> with, you know, no comps. And and so there are, there are just extremely powerful economic development impacts beyond simply what's created for the production of housing. And um, and we can get into this if we want, but this is this is sort of further down the uh, further down the road. Um, these are just some things that we're advocating for uh, on the go forward. Um, so I'll stop the share there, but I'm happy to you know open up for questions. We can put up other exhibits and materials, uh, but want to give you all the opportunity to tell us which way to go. Awesome. That was amazing. Um, I see Bob Struckman has hopped on, so we'll let him talk a little bit um, um, just to give some labor context about our housing construction scene since it's just booming so dramatically. So um, Bob Struckman is the senior Western field representative, Northern Rockies and Alaska. Prior to his current role, he served as a speechwriter for the late and former AFL CIO president, Robert Trumka. Uh, Bob has extensive experience with the AFL CIO's Housing Investment Trust which invests in using union contracts to build high quality housing uh, by and for working people. So we'll hand it over to Bob and then we'll have some questions that for both speakers here. Thanks, uh, Natsuki. Um, hey, um, uh, uh, Ken and Zach, that was awesome. Um, and 
um, when I lived in DC or, you know, lived and worked in DC for a good decade, um, it wasn't actually in DC. I was in uh, Montgomery County and, um, love the way you guys uh, run things up there. Um, it's just, it's really a, an amazing place to be. Um, certainly some particular challenges. I mean, just the cost of living there is really high and, and um, other things like that. So, so yeah, so I work for the AFL-CIO, which is the coalition of um, unions, uh, the largest coalition of unions in the country. Um, I work from basically from Colorado to Alaska um, with, um, all the state, all the federated bodies, um, and you know the, you know narrowly you'd say, well, you know local 400 of UFCW deals with a bunch of uh, workers who are at grocery stores and pharmacies and stuff like that in the DC area, um, but um, it, but if you look or like any 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 union any any sort of particular union is going to deal with their work site, they've got a union contract on the job and they got to. Um, please the, the the contract and that kind of thing, but um, if you if you understand us as workers as, as people who go to work and then come home from work and have a life and we live in a community and we have family and friends, then you start to sort of get a uh, idea of all the various ways that our unions can work together to affect our lives, and um, and that's really that's really kind of like i guess the the part of the job that i that i really um focus on a lot is like all the areas outside of of work yeah we're trying to grow our unions we desperately need to grow our unions america needs unionism in a bad way um but we also need so many other things like a place to live you know a lot of the folks here can i don't know if you guys went into this already but you know you know, Bozeman is incredibly expensive. The Gallatin County area in Montana in general. I mean, all of America has a housing crisis. Um, but to get to my specific um, uh, role with housing, basically it's, it's in two ways. One is our unions um, have retirement accounts. And those retirement accounts are each um, um run by a you know handful of, of of people between split between the employees and the employers so there's all these pension boards and those pension boards um, make decisions about where they invest um, those pension dollars and um, some of those pension dollars get invested into the AFLCO housing investment trust and the housing investment trust is a mutual fund that is operates by all the rules of every mutual fund but what they do is they invest exclusively in housing and it's housing that is union built union operated and union maintained and it's um and it's also um almost always affordable housing so you know having a fund that invests in housing is is important and is a big step in the direction of doing something but it doesn't take care of everything um you need a place to build right? You need a site. You have to have control of the site. You need to have allies, um, you know, um, design, you know, designers, architects, um, engineers, engineering firms, um, developers who are willing to work with you and who are willing to work all union, not all of them are. It's our contention that um, rock bottom um, construction, like for instance, when the Missoula Housing Authority uh, pursues a um, a you know a, a housing project by going with the lowest bidder, they're actually increasing the demand for affordable housing while they're supposedly alleviating it because none of the people who are working on that project are able to buy into it. And so we want to have people who are working on our projects have the have the ability to um, you know get a get a skill, a marketable skill that can be used anywhere. High, you know, you, if you become a skilled member of the building construction trades, you can stay in Montana if you want, or you can go anywhere you want, and you've got a very valuable skill that is gives you access to a career quality job. And that's really like that's a principal part of of our role, you know, or what of our goal, I should say. So um, right now in Billings, we're working with a local um, architecture firm called. 
uh, High Plains Architects, several small uh, developers, because a lot of it is capacity. We just don't have a ton of capacity. And we're working with the city of Billings and some other partners, as well as the Housing Investment Trust. And we're slowly rolling toward building a 12-story um, uh, apartment tower in downtown Billings, which I'm really excited about because I grew up here and it'll be the first time that we've changed the skyline since 1984. Um, I, when I was in middle school, walking past the first interstate bank. And unlike the first interstate bank, this building will be platinum lead. It'll be um, built to the highest environmental standards. It'll also be, it'll also have a huge affordable housing component and it'll be union built. And as much of the source material as we can will be union sourced. And so um, it, it's just, it has a lot of, of other pluses. That's like, let me just tell you, it's, I don't know where you guys can and Zach, where, how the process was to get where you got, but it's a rocky, rocky road. And for every step forward, it seems like we take 27 steps back and then we have to regroup and come back again. It's not easy. And it takes a lot of kind of bullheaded. I mean, I guess I'm just somebody who doesn't understand when I'm beat. So I just keep pushing um, it because we, because we're now making progress and it's really exciting. Um, Bozeman has been a, a place where we've been trying to work and where we'd love to work it's it's not easy it's not easy um the other the other main source of housing we're working on is actually in a very different type of housing environment it's in the kind of housing environment where there isn't any now anyone who's got a million bucks can build a million dollar home it doesn't really matter where the hell they are but if you're in roundup montana or forsyth montana or any other small out of the way towns and you're a teacher there might be nowhere to live, by which I mean, there's no house that a bank will insure. You can't, I mean, half the houses in Roundup have uh, coal-fired uh, furnaces in the basement. Like, you actually got to get coal. You got to put it into the chute, and then you got to you got to put it, you know, through, you got to put it in your furnace. And so we don't, there's no history of buying and selling of, of homes that are affordable in Roundup that will allow banks, I mean, bank, if, if there's not, if, it's, if it doesn't exist, banks won't do it. If there's not comparables, they're like, nah, doesn't, doesn't work here. Even if you could pay the mortgage, even if whatever. So we're working with a number of, coal, uh, number of allies in the town of Roundup, Montana, which is a marvelous little town, you know, kind of a cousins who went to school there. Um, we're turning the old central school an old sand, sandstone school, it's about 120 years old, into uh, 20 some housing units. Like the tower down in Billings, it will be you know, to the highest environmental standards. And, and that's because our, our partner um, architect firm, um, that's what they do. And the main reason we, we really like that is if our unions are gonna build, are gonna gain market share and become and, and really develop um, expertise, we have to be doing the building um, processes of the future. We have to be the best at the newest, most important stuff. And so our, our unions are, are buying into it. Our, um, you know, we have a, a, a really good uh, firm that we're working with. And you know, as much as some people might like to say like, you know, do we want everything to be nonprofit? Do we want things to be government owned? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. And a lot of what we're doing, it's got to be whatever. So this is going to be partly controlled by the tenants, partly by the school district. That's that's what we got because the school district owned the building. You know, um, we're going to be working on, on on one up in Lewistown that is the next in the in the string. And that one is going to have a really weird, complicated ownership structure, which could go wrong. You know, like our union investors are going to be made whole, but I don't know that that's one we can guarantee is going to be affordable for the long term. It's 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 a you know, kind of live and learn. I mean, I'll be honest, we've we've kind of had our asses kicked on a few of these projects, um, and we're doing the best we can and learning as we go. Um, 
I, I would really like to, you know, and or the beauty of the of the financial aspect of it is when we invest in these in these projects, then you know, like the the biggest hurdles are often like the the construction loan. Um, and so our unions are putting up the money for the construction loans, which means that as soon as that construction is complete and we go into permanent financing, we get our money back and we can put it into the next loan. And um, like with, uh, with with Ken and Zach, what the goal is to, is to sort of make a system that will create itself again and again, because, you know, 21 units in Roundup is great, but you know, that's not, that doesn't solve the problem. It's, you know, going to be 14 or 15 new jobs for young people or people getting new jobs in the Roundup area. And that's wonderful, but that's not enough. We need it to, we have to build the scale. And so the goal is to, um, you know, is, is to build something that can be replicated and, um, and to do it in towns here, there, and everywhere. Um, so, I think that's pretty much the rundown. Um, awesome. Back yeah, to you, thanks. Natsuki. What do you think? Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. So I think we'll open it up to questions from our audience here. I know there's probably some very specific questions that we want to ask either um, with our experts from Montgomery County or from Bob. So if people have questions, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and come off mute. I, I have a question, if I may. Um, Zachary and, and Ken, thank you so much for this presentation. It's incredibly helpful and, um, yeah, it's been really, really great. Uh, I just have a question to follow up on a meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago, um, with, uh, Nathan Bilyeu, who is the general counsel to the Montana board of housing and is the, uh, the bond council specifically for Gallatin County, which Bozeman is in. Um, in the meeting, we had a really great conversation, um, kind of delving into the details of like state of uh, Montana's statutory um, framework around housing authorities. And I know you all mentioned that 50 years ago, um, the HOC was created in like close conjunction between uh, local and state government to try to ensure that that model that you all are employing is is one in which there can you have the the tools you need to be effective. Um, one of the limitations that that Nathan mentioned in our last meeting was actually around. Uh, income requirements and that uh, according to Montana code, um, housing authorities can actually technically only serve uh, and own housing of uh, that serves low income residents. So the, the the kind of the mixed income model is one that I think is is a bit uh, challenging given the current framework and he cited a wide range of needs of, of kind of a statutory reboot around housing authorities to give us the tools we need locally. So I'm just curious, I know, again, this is probably ancient history given it was 50 years ago, but um, if you know, if you if you all faced similar hurdles in kind of getting to a place where you were able to own public housing that could serve this social housing model. Um, yeah, like you said, I, I mean, obviously we weren't, neither, I don't think either of us were uh, around, so I can't really recount the political, you know, discussion. Um, but it was, it is explicit in our code uh, to have allowances because you know we were as you said we were originally created as a housing authority which meant serving low and moderate income families only, um, and then uh, there was this expanded uh, mission with you know mixed income housing in mind, um, and uh, so uh, it is kind of explicitly laid out in our authorizing statute uh, in our state state code and county code. Um, and that's what has really allowed, you know, this kind of creativity. Um, I guess I would, you know, I, I think one of the things we've realized as we have met with a number of different jurisdictions, um, you know, that are interested in this model is that there's definitely not a, a one size fits all model here. I think, every, you know, so you, you kind of need a few different pieces and they, and they may come all under one roof, but, uh, it may be in other places, you're taking uh, uh, parts from different organizations. So maybe you have one that's the finance agency and, and then it also may make sense to create a new uh, entity uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, giving it to an existing one um, if they have those limitations. Uh, maybe that's sometimes easier than, you know, going back and changing the code. Um, so for example, that's what they're doing in Atlanta uh, where they've created a new, 
uh, development entity that's going to that's a subsidiary basically uh, of the public housing authority, um, but has a separate uh, kind of whole authorizing scheme. Um, so I don't know if that precisely answers your your question, but it sounds like you you might need um, some adjustments to the code uh, if you're going to you know use the public housing authority as your core uh, entity to to deliver this model. And and I'll just add, add to that that. Um... Like the one of the key things Ken said is you really will be spending a lot of time in like literally in the legislation, enabling legislation, legislation of entities that you may not even know exist. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Bob talking about even using the school system, like all of these things should be on the table around, you know, what's a viable entity. And what's the politically viable entity? You know, what are the politically viable changes? Uh, one thing that's happened elsewhere in the country, again, it's very specific to enabling legislation, but some PHAs have got around, gotten around that by simply creating a 501c3 nonprofit. And it's not covered under the enabling legislation. It's It's got all the liberties that a 501c3 nonprofit has. Uh, there are pros and cons to that. So I just, one thing I would definitely recommend though, is really get into, sadly, is really get into the weeds, like get into the language and the legislation um, because there's often an entity that wouldn't necessarily first come to mind as the right one to flow things through, or even, or you may ultimately determine that, you know, even creating, there are lots of good reasons not to use your housing authority. We're a housing authority. There's, there's actually reasons not to use us. Um, I think it's the. I think it was the right decision for the county, but there's definitely reasons not to use, you know, existing entities sometimes. So these are definitely uh, some weeds you'll be getting into if y'all decide to kind of go down the road on this. Yeah, thank you both so much. That's that's incredibly helpful. I'm I'm not an attorney, so I don't I don't uh, claim to have the the expertise to be able to really parse out exactly you know uh, the terms of our M MCA, but. Um, I wish that Nathan was able to join us today. He sadly had a conflict, but um, I, yeah, I think we're we're on the path of of really trying to determine, uh, you know, exactly what is and isn't attainable for us, and and what what model would be successful. So I I put the code in the chat, but the the Montana code actually referenced low income persons as being unable to um, pay without assistance, basically as determined by the housing authority. So I think there would be some flexibility there, given that. Um, our AMI has gone up a lot, and there's a lot um, of affordability build be issues, even with that 80% AMI that level that we're seeing. Um, but we'll go and give it to David. I think he had his hand up next. Thanks. Great. Hey, uh, thank you very much for for joining us today, Jack. I really appreciate it. and uh, Ken and Robert appreciate you all being here. Um, I, I have a couple questions that are in the weeds about the finance structure. Um, what the, the first one is you have this housing finance agency that is the source of takeout financing after the construction period. What, where did the money for the house? Where does the money for the housing finance agency come from? Yeah, so the the housing finance agency is simply a lender, um, and so it is effectively it doesn't the the money. It's not like um, there's a pot of money that. Um, it's drawing from to make these loans. They can be bond finance. They can simply be um, mortgages that are cr are created. And so the the HF like probably every tax credit deal that's happening in the state of Montana has the HFA most likely as as the lender on the deal. That's typical of most states, and they're just simply authorized to create those loans. They just underwrite them so that they're um, they're obviously, um, you know, they're not seeing a high level of default. So, so really, um, uh, that's, a like, and so we happen to have that, we happen to, we're very strange in that we, we are actually a state HFA, which is very unusual to have that combined. But if we weren't there, Maryland also has a state HFA that is completely capable of providing, the same kind of permanent, very, and it's very like this very vanilla finance, like uh, the FHA risk share loan. Uh, you, you've probably heard of like, you know, a, 20, a 221 D4 on the construction side from HUD. Like these are all very, very ancient HUD loan types that have, a, you know, a million transactions onto the under them. 
The nice thing about having the state HFA on board, though, is they can really make that process go fast, particularly if they are authorized by HUD to um, to actually loan on behalf of HUD like we are. Um, because if you have to go through HUD's, you know, HUD sort of field office for the for the underwriting, it can take a really, really look, take nine to 18 months. Uh, you can also, uh, they can also decline for market concentration. There's lots of different risk there. But, um, but yeah, like happy to spend more time uh, here or in a breakout on like how the HFA plays its role, but it's really not dissimilar at all from the role it already plays for the tax credit deals in the state. Great, thank you. I have more, but I'll let other people jump in. <laughs> Maybe Britt, I see your hand up and then there's a chat from, a question in the chat from Jennifer, but we'll go ahead to Britt. Um, I'm not hearing him, are other people hearing him? Mm -mm. Okay, sounds like you might be having some mic issues. So um, you can put it in the chat maybe. And then Zach, I don't know if you're able to speak to Jennifer's question in the chat about um, how much money from the county was actually, or how, where that money came from. Yeah, really appreciate the question because it's one of the strengths of, of using municipal bond financing to create the fund. So, uh, you know, Jennifer's got it, got it right. And that's okay, your follow-up has also got it right that, by bond financing this, it is not a, you know, it's not a, a first year five, you know, $50 million appropriation, which is obviously a heavy lift for almost any municipality jurisdiction. And so instead, what we do is we issue bonds. In this case, HOC actually issued the bonds and the county just simply has, has said that it will pay the principal and interest payments for 20 years on the bonds that HOC issued. So it just transfers us the annual payments. We pay the bondholders. 20 years, it goes away. But it doesn't have to be done that way. The municipality, you know, Montgomery County could have just issued the bond itself. But because it's a bond issuance, it's, it's paying for that 50 million over 20 years. And so uh, very, very sadly and tearfully, uh, when we did the first 50 million, um, rates were much, much lower than they are now. And so you are correct that for the fifth, first 50 million, the county is paying $3 million a year in principal and interest for 20 years, fully amortizing. And, um, and I'll get back to a really key imp important point there. So uh, if we, when we issue the second 50, which we're about to do, it's obviously in a much higher rate environment, but even, on, even in this higher rate environment, it's still only about four or four and a half million per year for 50, for another $50 million installment. And then here's sort of the key. We then turn around and loan that money into our own projects. So we, you know, that bond issuance creates that 50 million. It goes into the fund that we control. We then loan it into our projects and we loan it into our projects at 5%, which is a rate that we just picked out of the clear blue sky to try to make it sound like we weren't being too greedy or something like that. I don't know. I don't even know what we're doing, but we just picked 5%. Seemed great. So 5% um, on 50 million is 2.5 million. So the projects are paying 2.5 million in interest per year back to the fund uh, because we wanted to make this as light a touch as possible on the budget, we actually send that 2.5 million per year per 50 back. So on the first first 50 million, the county is only paying a net of $500,000 a year because they're paying 3 million gross for the principal and interest, but then they're receiving the 2.5 million per year back. And this interest is actually capitalized in the HPF deal. So it's like literally capitalized in the budget. So there's no like, are you going to be able to pay that interest? It's actually in the, in the development budget. So it just, it's getting shipped back to the county uh, on time. And so even at four, four and a half million per year, you're still at something like 1.5 million net per year for 20 years. And then it's free after 20 years. And it keeps the, the, the fund continues to revolve once the bonds are paid off because the funding is simply a temporary bridge funding, you know, very similar to what, you know, Robert was talking about with the union funds. Very, it's, it's actually really, it's, it's really cool to, to see how he got to so many of the same places that we did in terms of like where the, 
where the need is, it's in that construction, loan construction equity financing. So that's why you only see such a small number in the budget. And it's, it was by design to really make it as light a touch from an appropriation standpoint as possible. And also in the long term to actually create a, you know, a zero cost ongoing tool. How is that not a general obligation of the, yeah. Ken? Of the, 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 How'd we do it? Because at least yep. your general obligation bonds have to go to the voters. So I'm yeah. just like imagining the bond council saying, um, well, that you could just not make the appropriation for that extra five hundred thousand um, dollars and it could fall so, apart. Like, how, how did you how did you deal with those issues? And maybe Maryland law is a little bit different. So I mean, first, yeah, we don't we don't have to go to the voters for uh, geo debt. So that's one. But that is the reason that we structured it the way we did was to avoid have because we do have you know a sort of a strict cap that the county imposes on geo debt. So we didn't want to be competing against you know schools and roads and uh, the kind of key uh, things. So that's that's part of how we structured the way we did. Uh, you're absolutely right that that is the way the the difference here between geo debt and and the bonds that we issued is that they are subject to appropriation, uh, and that does of course impact the rate. Um, you know, we still got a very favorable rate. I think you know uh, our county is a AAA rated uh, county, uh, and so having uh, you know an agreement, uh, you know, backing the bond issuance that basically said the county will pay agrees to pay this funding um for 20 years but uh it is subject to appropriation so if there was you know a total crash and the county uh elected not to appropriate that funding there's nothing that bondholders could do at that point to like reach in and and grab the county's reserves or whatever um which they you know they could potentially for geo bonds um but um you know, it, it worked out. Uh, I think there are similar structures that the county could have issued, as, as Zach said, uh, that we have different kinds of like revenue bonds or uh, by appropriation bonds. Um, and, uh, you know, we did have some interesting conversations with our finance and budget teams uh, about how this was, you know, about how the accounting was going to work here. Um, but thankfully, you know, I think that was part of having really strong political support uh from across the board um and uh you know i think ever since you know we've been through three or four rating cycles and have not the county has not lost its triple a rating um you know since this issuance so uh it seems to have uh, uh worked out okay do do our folks from montgomery county have to hop off or do you have time for a couple more questions i can hang Okay, um, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on something that Ken just said, which is, um, which actually is probably the most important piece to me is the it's the political angle and it's basically an organizing question. Um, it's it's I, to me, I mean, and and please take everything I say with knowing that this is a I'm learning as we go and we're and we're doing the best we can and we're not going to stop. But I don't have all the answers. But the real, the real important thing here is getting the people who care about this issue into the same space and coming up with systems that work. Like I don't know that there's any one idea that's the the idea. And um, but a lot of these problems can be solved if you have the political will, and you build the political will by listening to people, by taking things into account, by adjusting. And and by understanding always, like one thing I like to say is, you know, it's not like when, when you're doing this, you got you're trying to get the 50 million bucks. How do you get it? Right. We're building the chicken and the egg at the same time. We don't have a chicken and we don't have eggs. And so you don't have something to hatch. Right. You don't have something to lay. But you do have the ability to try and make something as you're doing it. And that's really the key. Um and so flexibility, inclusion, making sure that if something changes, get on the phone and call everybody. Or say, for instance, like one thing that happened with us, I get a call from one of our contractors, our signatory union contractors saying, hey, these guys, you said they were going to be all union. 
and we just heard that they got a non-union uh, sprinkler fitter uh, putting in the the sprinkler fitter. This is bunch, what you're doing is a bunch of bullshit. And so I, instead of saying, okay, well, I guess we're fucked, you know, I then called the contractor, the general, and I said, this is what I just heard. What's going on? And they said, well, yeah, that one was the best con, the best um, bit. I was like, I don't think you understood the whole union thing. We got to stop this and we got to start over. And, and so my point with that is that there are time, there's going to be, if any, any coalition, there's going to be a million chance, times when it's going to want to fall apart. And sometimes that person who calls to yell at you is actually the best moment to bring people together. It's a moment to take a look at it and be like, well, you know, this now really the question is, do we want to have this be the way that we said or not? You know, and so it's that always keeping the people close who care the most and, you know, holding on with them to, to the goals. And so, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll yeah. maybe combine some of Britt's uh, questions from the chat. Um, so we don't have a public housing authority here. We, our government doesn't have the infrastructure of being a public developer. We don't, some of the um, buildings you talked about, well, a lot of units. So we don't have that property management experience as well. Um, so maybe what would you recommend or what's the most important thing that we might need to key on if we want to start replicating some of the, the successes? Yeah, so I mean, it's it really is taking into account a few things. So one, like how much production do you think, you know, getting a real handle on like how much production you really need. I mean, if you're in in Roundup and you think, two buildings kind of get you get you there for the next 10 or 20 years. And I don't know, I'm just saying, but like we have places in Maryland where if you built 300 units, you're like good for decades. And so you don't necessarily, need, you know, the revolving piece doesn't necessarily matter as much. It, it's probably not as important to set up a big entity to oversee all that. You know, you want to stay kind of lean and you want to get the thing done and you want to get it done in the best way possible. But what's great about all of this is that is, you know, I, I want to echo what Robert said around coalition building that there's so much that can be built on this platform. I mean, we work with the private sector almost all the time on new construction deals. We, you know, we, so, so the, this is not like something that the private sector is hostile, hostile to or doesn't like, or uh, we also are able to deliver on very progressive values too, like keeping people uh, working and um, having rental increase restrictions on our units, whether you're in market rate or affordable and putting lots, you know, and having a, a robust resident services, set of resident services that gets deployed to every community uh, and economic development, which, you know, as much as people disagree on these days, in general, most people like the, you know, the outcomes of, of, of well-done economic development. So, there's a lot to, you know, there's a lot that, 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 that really can build a big tent here. And so what's also nice is the most important thing you'll have if you create this fund is the fund. Like everything else is kind of outsourceable. Like you could, when I got to HSC in 2013, we didn't have a real estate division. Like it just didn't exist basically. So it started with, with me and my boss working every day together and we slowly built out a team, but you know, there are, there, are, you could run, um, you know, Billings could do this with two people, three people. Uh, you could find your, some of your favorite local developers who uh, you really trust and have done high quality work before or from someplace nearby where again, you can really look at their work and say, Hey, that was great. And you can do what HSE did, which is, come get somebody like me out of the private sector who wants to do this for various reasons and um, and just knows how to put the money in the right place. The first HPF deal we did was actually a completely entitled and designed deal by private sector um, firms that we happen to know well and trust and like, but they had gone all the way through the process and they got stuck on, on like two things. And they came to us and they said, hey, can you help us with these two things? One of which was financing. And we were like, absolutely. And we're just going to own, we're just going to be the majority owner in the thing. And they're like, fine. 
great. Like you get us on stock, we're, we're happy, you know, we're happy clams on the private, you know, these are private developers, for-profit developers, but they're, they are thrilled at having much more certainty and the ability to get, get going on their transactions. And so you could get one or two people, you know, an office in Billings and go find your two favorite development deals that are stalled out right now, issue your fund and go take those deals and the developers will probably thank you and you're done. And then in terms of like operations, you can also like, we have third-party managers that are fully responsive to our commission. Our commissioners can hire or fire those developers in 30, or sorry, those property managers in 30 days for any reason. Uh, and so you, you know, there's, a, there's lots of, there's lots of compatibility with, um, you know, with a wide range of people. This is not, you know, this is not, one of the reasons we don't call it social housing is that we call this public ownership is because we don't want this to convey and we want it to feel very, you know, not very nonpartisan, very apolitical. Like this is a solution for a problem that touches everybody because we all live somewhere. So I would just say that like, you know, we are happy to have further conversations, but I've had conversations with, you know, people all over the country, big and small. And the main thing I tell them is you, you really don't need to start with much. You just need one or two people who know how to, to know what the private, really frankly are familiar with the private sector development model. Cause it really is the private sector development model, except we're just, we're just pulling it over to the private side with our, our to the public side with our funding. Um, and being owners, and we're just simply owning the real estate. And it doesn't mean we can't use the best constructors and the best managers and the best operators uh, who are contractors to us, and we have all our rights under those contracts. So, um, Zach, I, I just wanted to follow up on something you just said, which is yeah. that the most important thing with this fund is the fund. Yeah, right. That's the money. Um, so, so part of the part, you know, part of the way I came to find out about this this model, which I think is really cool, the housing production fund, is um, a conversation about um, creating a housing authority here local, locally. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, based on your experience, if, if, if a local government wasn't prohibited from doing these things with the housing production fund, would they need to do it under the umbrella, umbrella of a housing authority? What, what do you see as the benefits of, or potentially even drawbacks of, of being under a housing authority umbrella? If, you didn't already have one and don't have any publicly owned housing right now here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reason why, and as I said, there are reasons not to have HSE be the group doing this and we don't have to talk about those things, but, but the reasons why it made sense to go with the HSE is because it had this 40 years business model that worked. And this was just simply a tool to help us do more of it. So there was a ton of stuff that made total sense and it would never, it was never going to happen another way. Like there's no way anything anything else was going to get done. So in that case, it's, it's always this combination of like political expediency and where do you already have more of the right people in the right place? And the answer might be, we don't have anybody, but it is my experience that even, that even in government, you actually may not even know you have those people until you tell them, Hey, there's this new thing to work on. And all of a sudden, you know, you, they reveal themselves, you know, it's, it's really, it's happened a half dozen times in 10 years for me where you pull somebody out of the budget office and it's like somebody brought them back to life. No offense to the budget office, but, but I would just say that like uh, if the, you know, one of the benefits of having it being, being sort of a state chartered entity, like we are is, is you can build in some independence. Uh, if, you know, if it's the County itself, there's direct control from either the executive or whatever your governance model is and the council. And so sometimes politics can get in the way. But again, what's politically expedient? Creating a housing authority from scratch or going through an entity that you have, which is why like even something like, you know, Robert going through like the school system, like these are all very creative and thoughtful ways to like, how can we use what we have in place already um, and balancing that with the political expediency of creating something new? And I just want to jump on top of that with this, but same thing, like the city and the county both have bonding capabilities. There's no, the city and the county have land. They have tons of land. The, you know, the, like 
the you know there's there's ready made um, infrastructures of all kinds with 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 organizations that are there, um, and so to me it it comes back to like. What are you trying to do? Like, if you want to have, if you want to build a housing authority, then then work on building a housing authority. If you want to build housing, then you know whatever is the quickest, easiest way to build the housing. I would say. I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't know, um, but you know, like I I looked into this a little bit the other day after you guys connected with that uh, developer from Bozeman or from Helena, and um, looked to me like any of the issues that would be hurdles, the the solutions are already exist so um that that would be my thought and i'd be glad i mean obviously we're going to keep talking um and so hopefully we'll we'll get something cool and then we can um, get everybody out to montgomery county to tell them how to do stuff and uh and i'll just add like atlanta uh has a very big successful housing authority and they did not like they literally just created an entity and named it and stuck four people in it and it does not have to be more complicated than that um so i yeah i think that's I, but i just i think what robert said is so important the more you can take from existing strengths you know existing um authorizations just balance that with uh you know whatever the legacy issues are because there are legacy issues but but it doesn't have to be a housing authority. you can literally just create an entity and call it whatever you want, stick four people in it and have it be the owner entity that's funding these deals and everything else can be outsourced to the folks who are, I mean, it sounds like you've already got, um, you've got stuff in the making already. So it's really just putting a vehicle by which to get funding to those transactions that can help, you know, those folks do more of what they're, it looks like they're being pretty successful at doing, notwithstanding its difficulty. I would just add, you know, I think part of the reason to do have a government in, entity, uh, although I think there's no reason it couldn't work with a really trusted nonprofit, uh, but is having that trust because part of what you're doing here is, you know, the way I look at it uh, is you're kind of front loading a lot of the decisions about what kind of housing you want to develop and and what the rules are. And, and you can make those rules whatever you want. They, you know, that's sort of the nice thing about this being locally funded is you, you're in control. Uh, but you, you're setting them out in advance uh, and you're, you're thinking of them as a floor and then you're giving it with this big fund to an entity that you then trust to, uh, you know, be able to deliver on those, whatever those sort of basic ground rules are. Uh, and then you trust that, you know, within that they're going to do the most affordability or uh, whatever other um, community considerations you, you want to put in there. Um, but you know, that's as as opposed to a sort of more typical uh, housing trust fund model where each project is coming in, getting evaluated uh, and sort of getting approved on a case by case basis, which just adds, uh, you know, so much time and effort and money uh, cost, you know, to every transaction. So uh, I think that's sort of the key thing is, is and by having a public entity, you, you know, you kind of know like they're permanent. <laughs> they can't run off with the money. Uh, if things don't work out, you can claw it back. Um, or if they make too much money, you can, uh, you know, retain control. Um, so I think that those are some of the reasons, at least in our jurisdiction, that we we went that route. Um, but, you know, as far as public housing authority, I mean, I think the only reason to, to go that route would be if you're also trying to get additional, you know, federal, uh, you know, whether it's vouchers or, or whatever other authorities that you would need a housing authority for. But for this, I, you know, I don't think there's uh, any particular advantage. Um, yeah, thank you for speaking to that efficiency piece that like having the same agency doing the managing the fund and making the decision and owning it, there might be a, actually an efficiency piece there that government might kind of get a reputation of not being efficient, but there might be some advantage there. So Zeth, did you have a question? I did. Um, so one of the questions that I have are, um, involves the 2.5 million, 2 million, I believe, that is sent back to the county. My, is the, does the county have a specific, um, is there a specific purpose or the way that that two and a half million is used? And is that two and a, two and a half million, um, yeah, I guess it's like to a large degree, 
you are in, the HSE is a nonprofit and they are paying back to the county uh, a certain fee every single year that I'm assuming the county can use to address whatever needs that may be. Um, is, is that correct? And then I guess the second one would be, does, because you're creating these commercial properties and these um, uh, multifamily properties as well as like have the uh, commercial piece to it um, or just traditional retail um, and grocery stores and whatnot, do these particular entities pay property taxes in any way, shape or form? And like, if they do, how does that work? Is it this, um, so like, is it a pilot program, like a payment in lieu of taxes? Um, how, and so that is a way that nonprofits are able to, or I guess that way that, how is that captured in that two and a half million that goes back to the county, I guess? Um, and hopefully that, hopefully that was clear. I think so. I think I can give a quick, relatively quick answer. I mean, you know, part of, again, we're as a government agency, we're able to have a contracting relationship with the county government that's sort of intergovernmental and is a little bit easier than uh, if we were even a nonprofit private entity where you might have issues around uh, procurement and stuff like that. Um, so we have an, you know, a, a, a funding agreement with the county that spells all this out. Um, it, the uh, annual payment is funded out of our housing trust fund. So this is money that, you know, we were, and that's part of how we were able to sell this is like, we have this fund, HOC is drawing on it for our projects anyway. So, you know, we're, we're going to create this fund for HOC. And now, by the way, like nonprofits, you now don't have to compete with HOC so much, uh, you know, and the rest of this fund uh, is now like freed up and available for other kinds of projects, whether it's sort of small group homes or, you know, there's a, a million kinds of uh, types of housing that, that get funded through that uh, mechanism. Uh, the interest payments that we make flow back into the uh, housing trust fund. So they would be available um, and they kind of just cancel each other out. Um, and uh, so hopefully that answers the, that first question. Um, and they, but they do stay in that housing trust fund. So they, they're not available for general fund use, although, you know, there's an annual general fund transfer into the trust fund. So, you know, everything's fungible uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, which they, you know, it, it could reduce potentially um, if there's excess funding in there. Um, I, I lost the second part of your question. Sorry. I believe it was generally just like if it's, if the commercial well, properties are paying like pilots. a property tax. Yeah. It, yeah. We don't, pilot. I mean, again, part of being a government, you know, we are tax exempt. We do have a pilot, uh, you know, basically hundred percent tax exemption under state and County law. Um, so yeah, we don't pay property tax um, or, and including, I think that, it, well, let, let me let Zach answer. I, th I believe that it does include the commercial. Yeah. I think the commercial tax. pays taxes, but the residential does not. So, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So there is, but yeah, you can obviously, if you know, if particularly since it sounds like you'll be creating something new, you can certainly um, figure that out. But um, yeah. So. Um, and then I just, there's a question in the chat around venturing with a nonprofit. And again, like, I think that that is a, prime strategy that's been used by other authorities throughout the country when they run into authorizing legislation issues. They can create 501c3s. Most of the time, the author is authorizing resolution is silent on that. And so it's simply a 501c3 that just has to comply with that reg. So, and, and most of the time that does allow for some of those features. Now you may still need to get other legislative changes for the 501c3 if there's a certain benefit that's automatic to the authority, but not, not a 501c3, but sometimes that can be easier. Um, but again, like it's worthwhile. I'm happy to even connect you all with, you know, um, with attorneys that have done this for, you know, very successfully for other authorities around the country. Um, we spent a lot of time talking with them around these same kind of issues but, you know, it really is the details, even, you know, like Natsuki's quote from earlier around, like, 
how to like really like what does the language actually say and you know could you basically comply with it in a way to where it, it effectively gives you what you want i mean it, it really is that level of of parsing things out and thinking things thinking through the actual implication of the language that um can make things a lot easier than you may than it may have first first sort of appear um and then i see david's question yeah so one of the core things about the bonds that are issued to create the fund is that they are not connected to the real estate at all. The bondholders, the, the buyers of those bonds are buying the bonds because they like the city of Billings as a, as a credit. That's it. And then those proceeds go into a fund that funds real estate. The bond, there's no connection to the bondholders, which is really, really, really helpful in, sell, in having to explain to the bondholders where they're getting themselves um, you know, getting themselves into. So like for, for ours, like they didn't care what H they didn't care what HSC was doing. This was about the, you know, the credit of Montgomery County, Maryland, which is very good. And if Montgomery County, Maryland wants to, you know, use its credit position to create $50 million to give to its housing authority for some such thing, that's fine because it's subject to appropriation. It's the Montgomery County. They're going to, they're looking to, to satisfy those bonds. Stag, I was going to jump in the, just because I'm just trying to make sure that I understood whether or not Dave's question was completely answered. I'm assuming it was, but I'm going to restate it. So the collateralization, that's something we've talked about here, just as another way to be able to pay for it. I believe that there was a project that I had um, stumbled across where y'all did like, I believe it was like that five acre parcel with the, or the five acre three building um, project. I can't remember the name of it, but like something along the lines of, I remember you saying that y'all did take the um, the equity out of the land or just pulled the equity out of that particular parcel and, and collateralized it in some particular fashion. Is that correct? Or um, if it is, could you like, I guess maybe speak to that? Like how yes. it did? Yeah, so when we go to finance the housing, we will often use uh, a completely separate sort of bond financing of the housing. So for instance, one of the nice things about the HPF is that uh, HOC can own it outright and as a governmental use, that means we can use governmental bonds and not use volume cap. It's actually one of the key features of the HPF because it, it avoids one of the major limiting factors in Maryland anyway, and in a lot of places, which you run out of tax exempt volume cap very quickly, private activity bond volume cap very quickly. So by having this be a governmental, you know, governmental use, we can issue governmental bonds, which there is no cap. It's simply you issue what you think it's smart to issue as a governmental entity. So, but there are two separate things happening. So the fund itself is populated by the proceeds from the one bond issuance, the $50 million bond issuances that the, count, the county is effectively doing, is effectively supporting. And so that's the fund and that fund is, becomes a source of capital for our new construction deals. But our new construction deals, we use bond financing, separate bond financing at the project level where those projects are you know, they are collateralized, but it's a separate bond issuance. It's project specific. It's project financing. It's not related to the HPF, the bond financing that created the HPF. So, uh, and the folks, and the folks buying the bonds that, you know, that, that finance HOC's deals are, you know, they're used to us as a credit in the market. And, um, and in the case of, and you may say, well, well, damn, we're, we've never done this. It's fine. That's where your state HFA comes in. So your state HFA comes in, and they're the ones that that you know they're the ones that the market is used to seeing in the market for housing bonds. And so it's it's the same situation there, just by linking up with them. All right, and then maybe one final question for all of our speakers. Um, maybe can you speak a little bit about how a, a pu public works program can kind of buffer against the impacts of a recession, both in terms of as employing people and kind of some stability in the cost of, of creating housing? 
Yeah, I mean, one of the major features we're seeing it right now is, you know, private deals cannot finance and cannot start, which means construction workers, builders don't have projects to work on. And, and in fact, one of the reasons why construction costs are so high right now is because during the Great Recession in 2008, uh, when... Um, when construction starts froze across the board, um, a lot of uh, talented tradespeople left the profession forever and never came back. And it's those it's that those those boom bust cycles that you know are devastating to um, you know to those trades workers and being able to retain trades workers over the long term, which is what makes them so good at what they do. Right, they gain experience. And so what this sort of financing does is ensures that there are projects that are going to proceed even in the depths of, you know, really difficult financing environment. Um, and so that means there are projects for people to work on uh, during the, you know, during the tough cycles. And, and, and it's not as much of an incentive to, to leave the trade for something that's more stable and give up, you know, to lose those skilled individuals. And then even so, you know, even 15 years later, we have construction costs elevated because so many, you know, talented tradespeople left the profession in 08 to 2010 and never came back. And we haven't been able to, um, you know, recover that talent pool since. Um, so it, it really, so smoothing those, you know, that boom busts, really chopping off those peaks and valleys and, and making sure that there's, there's continuous work uh, is really valuable to everyone, private sector included, because they benefit from a robust, you know, pool of skilled tradespeople. Because then you don't have to, you're not fighting over subcontractors. You're not trying to steal one subcontractor from somebody else's project because there's literally nobody else to work on it. I would add to that. There's a couple. couple I would say there's a couple wrinkles. I agree with a lot of what Zach said, but you know, one thing that happened in 08 was the market share of our signature of our signatory contractors and our our unions in construction fell because of what Zach said. As as construction resumed, a lot of the work that 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 came back really went to bottom dwellers. They went to the people who pay the least and give people the smallest incentive to learn new skills and really get good at it. I would never disparage somebody who who works, you know, people need jobs, right? So it's not like they're bad people, but it's hard for anyone to um, justify investing in themselves in terms of gaining more skills and stuff like that if they're not getting paid right, if they don't have insurance, if they don't have a retirement. And so you know, that's that's a big part of it. And so one of our big efforts, and I know actually Montgomery County is is very much into this as well, is to grow our building trades unions. And it's not just to grow unions for union's sake. It's because people need what unionism has to offer, which is collective strength to get stuff like good retirement, good health care, good pay. Then the other thing is just um, as a as an example of the power of of um, these models of um, um, you know like what they have going on in Montgomery County and the AFLCO Housing Investment Trust. We have uh, during the during the 08 crisis and and in those couple of years afterwards, the AFLCO Housing Investment Trust did the same volume of work. We, there was no, I mean, it's not like people didn't need a house, place to live. And we were with the way we work is not to build and sell for the highest amount. We build and hold for 30 years because we want a steady return to pay out our um, our obligations, our pension obligations. And so we became the second largest um, uh, low income housing builder in the country during those during those years, because everyone else, if they couldn't get you know, 30% return, they they were just like, screw it. Bring all the money together and wait so that we, so we can get those massive returns again. 
we we think there's a better way, which is steady returns, always the same structure. We didn't get excited when things were hot. We don't get scared when things go down because people need a place to live and we need a place to invest our money in a way that we know it's going to build unions and build our communities and improve for the long haul. And so, you know, we're really, you know, that, that's something which I, I just really like that. It's kind of too bad that we, we became the second largest in the country because it's not like we grew, it's that everyone else shrank. And so we need more organizations like the AFLCO Housing Investment Trust to be able to provide that um, underlying um, stabilizing force in the economy. Anyway, that's that was my thought on that. Wonderful. I think we'll leave it there um, since we are at now and a half now. So thank you so much to Bob, Ken, who I know I had to hop off, and, and Zachary, of course, for your time and all the, your insight and experience that you shared today. So thank you so much for everyone for joining. and. Thanks again for everyone for your sharing all your thanks, thanks for the invite. Thank you. Have a great day.